All right, guys. Thanks for being here. I know it's somewhat confusing. Uh, no, I, need, I just need to apologize. I've never had a semester like this where I've been just so so flummoxed, for lack of a better term. You know, I'm usually, you know, come on in, take a seat. I'm usually just so buttoned up and on top of everything. I just don't know. It, you know? So, I, I, so I need to apologize, you know, for that. Um, I know if you spoke to any of your colleagues who have had me before and they go like, yeah, you know, it's, it's maybe a little bit out there at times, but <laughs> at least he has his act here. You know, this has been very difficult for, for a number of different reasons. <laughs> So I don't know. I don't, you know, I didn't like the online experience at all. I thought that was an absolutely horrendous experience, you know, with the lack of engagement. You know, as I said, as a social psychologist, I mean, I want to be involved, you know, I want to get the entanglement, as I call it, you know. I like to, you know, and amongst you know my kinds of people, you know, we like to argue, discuss, and you know, just and kind of get, you know, get, get it going, you know. And you can't do that online. So I thought the hybrid would be a so much better experience, you know, statistically significant experience. But what I found with hybrid, you know, this is my own personal opinion. You know, because what I found with the hybrid is like, it starts, it stops, it starts, it stops, it starts, it stops. I, I can't get, you know, a rhythm and I can't get a cadence. And <clears throat> just a little disclosure on myself. I was, you know, before I went to graduate school, I was thinking about going to music school. I was trained for like 15 years on keyboards and whiz. And, you know, it's important for me to kind of get the flow and, you know, and, you know, let, let the whole kind of thing kind of work with me. And they can't, it's very difficult sometimes for me to just start and stop and start and stop and start and stop. So once again, I apologize for that. I think next semester is going to be better because it's going to be live. I don't think there's many hybrid classes next semester. Am I wrong about this? Uh, all right, someone can answer. It's okay. 65%. Like 60 40 split? Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing everything live next semester. That's, you know, that's 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 going to be my thing, you know. So, you know, I just hope for myself psychologically that'll be a little bit better experience, get the flow and the rhythm going, as opposed to the stopping and starting. Where are we? What are we doing? Anyway, anybody close to graduating next semester? Guys are all starting. You're that little kind of fresh. Summer. Summer? Good man. All right. Good man. Get it done. Yeah. Yeah. It gets to be. A, I remember when I was in graduate school. Got to be a point of like enough already. You know, it really gets to be like it's like when does this stop? You know, doing this since you're five years old, right? So it's kindergarten, right? And here you are. Well, some of us have. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, we we all. And I hope that you know, you know, with this experience here, just as I kind of talk a little before we get into the material, this kind of you say music vamping a little bit, waiting for another body to kind of fly in. You know, it's just, you know, I, I hope I help grease the wheels a little bit to make it a little bit less painful, you know, a little bit less exhausting, you know, as you continue your your, your, your work. Because when you go out and you get a real job, you're gonna have to work also. So you know, fine. That's no, that's not a panacea either, you know, that's not a great thing. Okay, let's talk about what we have left remaining on the table of requirements, and let's see if we can check some boxes. Next class is our last class. All right, nobody's going to like break into applause. Okay, good. Okay, so next week is our last class. We're meeting live because I want to make the last class live. I don't think there's any questions, anything like that. Whether we go for the full hour and change or two hours and change is irrelevant. I'll be here to field any questions. I don't want anyone going into the final the following week having any unasked questions or not having enough information that they have. I want everybody going to the final nice and calm and relaxed. Just kind of do your thing, hand me the papers and say, have a great holiday. And I just want to make it a very calm, as, as calm as it can be or as, or as comfortable as it can, okay? I know it's a final, I know it's important, I know great for the whole team. So let's take a breath. Let me see that. Okay, so next week is our last class. I want to meet that. The final has to be live and in person. Okay, we're going to do the final live and in person. I think I sent out the date for the final. Yes? Yeah, okay. So the final is going to be, I think, that Thursday at 8 a.m. Not next week, but the following week. 
Okay, format's gonna be the same. Some identification stuff, some essays, right? And because I got a little bit of lead time here, I'll decide which chapter is gonna be there. Um, I may dig back a little bit to some of the earlier chapters because I wanna have what they call, and some folks have heard me use this term so a million times, a target rich environment. The less I have to choose from, the more microscopic or more, you know, the more definitive the questions have to be. I want more broad stroke questions. Okay. So, you know, much more, I, I really like philosophy of science, you know that. Now we're taking an essay, it's also the other thing when you go through, the other thing that they don't tell you, you know, when an instructor is or a lecturer is presenting, you can tell when they get excited about a topic. So you can know, trust me, on a final or an exam, they're gonna ask those questions. They don't wanna read 30 papers on something that they consider boring. They wanna ask questions that they have interest in as we go through it. So you kind of guys know my philosophical bent and the kind of things that I ask. So you know how to kind of focus it inherently or intuitively, okay? So you guys should be good with that. But we'll talk a little bit about that next week. Um, I'm just thinking, how many folks here do wish to meet next week? But don't, don't be bad, I just need to know. It's not a, there's no like, you know, we're gonna bring out a, Guillotine and like those people. Every, okay, and how many people would just rather do like a Zoom Q and A that kind of thing? I think the online's are. Uh, I think the live and in persons, you know, have won that. But what I'll do anyway is I'm going to tape it up, right? I'm going to record it. So if you want to be here live and in person, that's fine. If you want to just, you know, I have a Zoom going now. There's like I think one person on there, whatever. Okay, so you're cool, you know. You know, players, players' choice. It's not open. No, it's not going to be an open note test you know, or open. Fine, you guys should know me now, by, by now that it's going to be stuff that it's much more philosophical in nature. Like you know, each question kind of starts with like you know, like in your opinion. You know, talk to me about the, you know what you're feeling about this. And like I said earlier, I don't care if you disagree with me. I like to mix it up a little bit. You know, I, I like other points of view because I end up learning something. If I'm sitting in my own echo chamber in my own, you know, um, you know, group thing kind of thing, I don't, I don't learn anything. Yeah? So, I, so I don't mind, you know, you don't have to be, you know, <clears throat> you know, be on the other side of an issue or, or position just to, you know, you know, just to do it just because of anything I expected. I just want to hear your thoughts. I'm expecting what you guys feel, your philosophical uh, and, and how you look and perceive it and how we do research and how things happen. That's, that's what I want to know. Don't you study every chapter? No, 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 no. I'll send out a, I'll send out a list. Okay, let me repeat my... It's okay. If you don't know, then other people are not. Trust me. <clears throat> I'm going to decide which chapters are going to be for the final. I may dig back a little further if I don't feel I have enough grist for the mill or if I don't have enough material to ask the more generalized question that I want. Okay, but it's not going to be as, you know, like, you know, I don't want to, the less I have to choose from, the more distinct I have to make the question, where it becomes more of a, there's less wiggle room. So I want to make sure everyone has enough wiggle room, you know, to put their thoughts together and all that. Okay, so don't, don't, don't worry about that. I'll, I'll prepare something that, that, like I said, you, you know, I mean, it's like main effects, as we call it. Not going to be nuanced. I'm not going to be this. You, you, you know it or you don't know it. And that's it. You know, learning is, is demonstrating how much you how much you've learned from the prior time to now. Okay, I don't need to show up show up how smart I am by asking tricky questions, but that's ridiculous, right? And I don't want to just sit and give out A's like M and M's either. So that the, 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 you know, I, I have to kind of walk a little bit of a line too. You have to demonstrate some confidence. In this field. And like I said, frankly, from where I'm standing here, I don't really have a, I don't really see an issue with with anyone being in like in a position of saying like, oh my God, this is gonna be problematic. Okay, so <clears throat> that's what I'm saying. It's like just be calm, just be relaxed. Let me do my thing, and and you know you'll take the exam. Go home and have a nice Christmas and New Year's. Okay. All right. So next week we'll, we'll we will be meeting live. Okay. And then the following week after that is the final, 
I will be checking the emails religiously between the final, between our last class and the finals day. If you do have any questions, okay, I'll be checking them, uh, very, you know, quite often. Okay, if you just send me a question and say like, you know, is, uh, you know, uh, you know, like how many questions are on the exam, I'm not going to get back to you too quick. But if you say like I have a question about the material and here's my question, I, I'll jump on it. Okay. So it's not like I'm blowing you off. It's just that, like, uh, you know, it's, it's it's not a critical burning issue. It's, it's not a red, it's not a hot button. So, okay. But you can ask any question you want, you know, send me an email, whatever. I'll, I'll get to it. If it's a hot button issue, I'll jump on it. If it's something like, uh, are we meeting in the classroom? You know, you send it to me, like, you know, like, at, you know, like that Monday, we're meeting on Thursday. I'll get back to you Tuesday. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, I got stuff to do too. Right? I'm busy, I'm busy. Kind of. Not really. All right. Today, here's what I want wish to accomplish. I want to talk, I want to talk about chapter 11 and chapter 12. And why do I want to talk about them kind of combined? And it's going to be a little bit of a longer lecture today. Maybe we'll take a break and see how much steam I have going. But we've set the table from chapter one moving forward of like, what is research? How do we do research? What do we look for? What are the, what are the elements that, that make good research? Okay, how do we avoid confounding and bias in research? Okay, and now that we've done research and we've developed the entire program, whether it's a pilot study and now you're going live and everything, now the very last part of it is you gotta cook it, right? So what's that gonna have to do? That has to do with analyzing the data. Okay, so you have to analyze it. Once you do it, that's the fun part. Now comes the part that everybody hates, right? Analyzing experimental data. Here, what we're trying to do here, and I was gonna to talk to this slide, is to say, how do I do a statistical approach based upon what I've done and avoiding error variance? Okay, because everything we've done, every technique, every kind of thing that the chapter has, as a pillar has been to avoid error variance. You have two types of variance in this person's research world. Well, you have more, but for our intended purposes. You have treatment variance and you have error variance. Treatment variance are sometimes called systematic variance. And you just look at the terms, like I said, you'll, you can suss out and you can dope out what those things are. Systematic variance or treatment variance, is all of the change that occurred is based upon my manipulation of the independent variable, right? You've said this a thousand times, you've heard this a thousand times. Error variants are changes that occur that I have no reason, I have no idea why. So if we look at that, at that ridiculous little aspirin study, some people are gonna take three M&Ms, they're gonna eat three M&Ms, and 20 minutes later, they're gonna feel better, right? I can't explain that that would be error variance, right? I've recorded that data, I've recorded it, and I have to account for it. And I have to see, is that error variance, that inflated term, is that going to kind of put a, obscure my real findings? Is it a problem in my design? So remember, as, I, as I've said, in experimental design, you're allowed to have some wiggle room. It, it can, it, it's not gonna be 100% watertight, okay? You can have some wiggle room because stuff happens in the real world. As I said a million times, research is, is, is dirty business. It's messy business. You gotta put on the hip waiters and you gotta get into the mix, into the muck, okay? I cannot control what goes on outside the store in terms of your lives. Can't do it. You have a bad day, you wake up in the morning, you have a headache, whatever, you come in, you're not a happy person, you can't focus, whatever, okay? So that's, I can't control that and that's going to affect performance and things of that nature. So that's, so that would be an error variance, okay? Systematic variance is like everything is copacetic and then we do the procedure and you get your score and it goes according to Hoyle, as they say, right? Three aspirin are going to mitigate your headache a lot better than three aspirin. I can account for that based upon my, my in, independent variable. All right, so the goal of the game within a statistical approach here when we analyze is to always keep an eye on how big that error term is. And the term that they use is, uh, 
inflation, right? Every term inflation. Okay, so they come up with inferential statistics. What is inferential statistics? Inferential statistics. Inferential statistics is psych 769. Okay. And what they do there is they say within inferential statistics, we infer from a sample to the population. So if you watch late night TV or if you watch any television and you see all these drug commercials, so I didn't realize, like, like I said, like how much of a how much of an issue in this country diabetes is. Right? Every everywhere I look, I see like a diabetes commercial. And I'm not trying to be glib or facetious. But how do you think they do that research? They have a sample of people who fulfill the requirements of diabetes, whatever their requirements are, right? When they do sample selection and they grab them and they give them the drug or placebo and they follow them or track their, their A1C blood levels, their glucose levels for a certain amount of time. At the end of that time, what do they do? They do a statistical approach where they go, is there a difference between this group and placebo, right? Between experimental and placebo. And if they, if there is, based upon the statistical approach, they go, lo and behold, this particular drug reduces, you know, the effects of diabetes. Now we can take a real life example. I don't know if you guys follow the news, but I kind of follow it kind of closely. I'm like a news nerd. And, uh, and you know, Merck has come up with a new pill, you know, as a, you know, a therapeutic for, you know, COVID, right? And now it's been rushed to the FDA and the FDA uh, trial is now deciding whether, I think they just approved it. I think it's going to go live in December, the Merck drug, right? But they didn't do a full-blown study because what they did is they had a pilot study and the results were so robust, it went directly from, you know, from, from go to finish. And that's how, and that's how robust it is because they did, they had people who had a certain amount of, of symptomology, they gave them the drug versus placebo, and they found how, how this drug really affected you know, their health in a, in a good way. And they said, you know what? It's so off the wall, it's so off the charts that we're just gonna go straight through. Because they set up an experimental design, they control for all the other types of extraneous variables, and they used inferential statistics which is the most, I don't want to say common statistic, but it's the one that's really the go-to to find what we call main effects. You guys know what a main effect is? I'll give you a quick definition. Main effect is like, is there an effect or not effect? Did the drug work? Did the drug not work? The three aspirin mitigate headaches more than three MNMs. Okay, that's what we call main effects. So and when you read research articles, especially in the abstract, when you're looking at them, they'll talk about main effects. So think of the term main effects. Hey, what'd you do? We did this and we did that. Sometimes they go a little further and say, let's say like now they talk about like this Omicron, like younger people are more affected than older people, right? That's a subgroup. That wouldn't be a main effect, okay? So, so this is what, this is the kind of the, the nomenclature they use, okay? So we use inferential stats to look at the probability of inferring to the population. In order to do this is the standard stuff that you've seen a thousand and one times. Okay, so stay with me. You know, we've got a little bit of time. I know it's like you want to go to the Bahamas in your head and Miami and whatever. Okay, I've been doing this for close to 40 years. Imagine, you know, if I was sitting there, I'd be like, you know, like the Corona commercial in my head. Okay. Okay, so you have, don't forget, you have the no and the in and the all in. These are mu's. Mu's are a Greek letter for me, okay? It's supposed to be little u kind of things. But my, but my Greek handwriting isn't that good, so. Okay, so you usually see stuff like this in the null and the alternate. What does, what does the null mean and what does the alternate mean? It means, the null means that there was no effect of what I did. Still not doing my Greek letters. I'm still not doing my Greek letters right. 
like no systematic variance? Correct. Doesn't mean that there wouldn't be any systematic variance, but let's get a little bit more definitive. It would mean that the differences between the two groups, because there's going to be differences, I'm going to explain this in a second. The differences are not significant. I cannot assign causality to the differences that we found. Because what is research? Because we're right now we're at the end of the deal here, right? Did I find something statistically significant? Because any changes that'll happen. So when we talk about this, we talk about this equal sign here. Um, you know, in my 769 classes, you know, my SAS classes, I like I, I, I kill this point. It's not that the means of the two groups are the same. It just means that there's no difference between them, even though they can be, even though they can be different. Okay, because there's going to be some differences between the groups just inherently, right? Because there's individual differences of people. Okay, this just means that the null means that there's no difference, there's no real difference between placebo and experimental. This one means that there's a significant causal difference between the two. Philosophy of science question, which hypothesis do we, I'm just, I'll answer it myself too. Which hypothesis, the null or the alternate, do we seek to prove in research when we do research? We always seek to prove the null. We always seek to prove the null. Because the way science is set up is that we work against ourselves. We throw roadblocks in our way. We make it more difficult to jump through the hoops because the understanding is the underlying state. Understanding is, is that if it's a real finding from nature that what we've done, well, then guess what? Whatever we do to try to obscure it, it's always going to bubble to the top. So a lot of people think like, oh, we just want to see this. And, to, and believe it or not, if you find non-significance between two groups, that's a real finding too. That's not a disaster because it just lets other researchers know that this approach is not an approach to find out about this particular issue. So avoid wasting your resources and things of that nature. I always use the same example. Someone said to Thomas Edison, oh, you tried to make a light bulb. It took you 2,000 times to do it and you got it wrong. And he goes, no, I found 2,000 ways on how not to make a light bulb. I mean, you could just kind of flip it around like that. Okay, so that's what the deal is with the null and the, and the null and the alternate. We always seek to prove the null because we work against ourselves. We have a real finding, it's gonna bubble up to the top. Don't forget another philosophy of science axiom that I like to use. Statistics and experimental design are artificial processes trying to get a handle on naturally or, or naturally occurring events, right? So if I have a headache, I can give you three aspirins of trying to kind of get a handle on that natural event, right? That painkiller or that you know, mitigating all that kind of stuff, all right? But it's, an, but it's an artificial event. That's why there's type one and type two errors. We make mistakes. The whole goal is to understand that and to get a handle on what we try to do here. Okay, rejecting to fail. I mean, I kind of spoke about this already. When we reject the null, we reject the alternate. Okay, number of things are happening here. You're saying we found no difference. We found a difference. Now, I, I mean, I'm not. We'll get into this in a second here. Let me let me move on to the next slide. The next slide brings us to type one, type two error. Have I, I, I have I discussed type one and type two really? Not really. Okay, not really. Okay, good. good. <clears throat> Two types of researchers in this world that I want you to have in your head. You have very conservative researchers and you have very liberal researchers. And I'm not talking about it from a political point of view. I'm talking about how these particular types of researchers look at the world. Okay. A very conservative researcher is going to be restrictive on who's going to be significantly different very tight bounds, you know, distill it down to its bare essence. Liberal researcher opens up the net and allows more people into the swimming pool to be significantly different, right? Both are damaging, okay? And this is the line that you have when you're reading research articles, 
to kind of figure out, is this person who's writing this piece, are they a liberal researcher where there's a lot more where the, where the, where the doors are wide open? Or are they more conservative where it's a much tighter band of picking the significant? How can you tell that? <clears throat> Before I get into what a type one and type two are. You look at the probabilities. They use a 0.05 or a 0.01. They use the 0.05, they're pretty conservative. I, I mean, I'm sorry. They use a 0.05, they're pretty mainstream. If they use a 0.1, which is 90 times out of 100, that's, that's a little bit liberal, okay? That's lets a lot more chant into the wheat, okay? That's like close enough, it's kind of good enough. And then you got the other folks on the other side who have 0.01, 99 times out of 100. They're the purest. No, it must be this way. And I'm looking, you know, for the most purest element of this, and I can draw conclusions from that. The only approach that really works, and the one that you have to keep an eye on, is that make sure that they're around 0.05. There's some variation. Some people use a 0.03. You'll, you'll see it. But it has to hang around 0.05. That's where you try to walk the line. And once the data starts to flow in, then you can start to play a little bit. All right? That's the art from the science. You know, That's where the statisticians uh, tend to manipulate the data. Okay. So what's a type one error? Let's make it down into English. I don't even know what this says. And I told you, I think Leary's a little bit, I think he's a little bit pedantic, if, if you will. A very bright guy, don't get me wrong, but I think he's a little worried and a little bit, you know, up in the clouds. So let's talk English. It's a type one error. I claim that there is a significant difference, but in actuality, there isn't. I claim that my manipulation caused a significant difference, but in that, but in nature, it didn't. So it's a statistical manipulation, right? That means type one error, the researcher is more liberal, right? It's letting more people it could be significantly different. Now statistics doesn't care what it is. Statistics is just an algo, which says take this value, subtract it from here, multiply it here and throw it in this matrix. Okay, it's just saying this is what I do. Has no qualitative meaning. Okay, so a type one error, I claim that there's a difference, but in actuality, there isn't. So what's a type two error? Type two error says no difference exists, even though there is a real difference. So that's the much more conservative approach. These are damaging approaches, these type one and these type two errors. Now, which one is work? Yeah, go ahead. It's the word difference. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're kind of talking concept here. So yeah, you can, you, you, can, you can swap math if you want, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. I claim that there is no significant difference, but in actuality in nature there is. So a type one era is where the researcher is a little too liberal in his statistical approach and his analysis and his inferential stats. And a type two, is that they're much more severe and restricted, okay? Both bad situations. It's like dying by fire or dying by water. One is neither better than the other because at the end of the day, it's still bad, okay? At the end of the day, it's still bad. So that's why I'm kind of saying from, from, our, from my perspective, from my perch and what, what I want you to kind of think about from a salient point of view is like, Okay, if I'm reading a research article, right? Because at the end of the day, you're going to walk out of it. You're not going to, no one's going to remember it. It's okay, because that's the way the world works. But maybe some things when you're reading a research article, go like, you know, it doesn't really look right. You know, this is like, this, this research is like 0.001, like 99.9% .9 of the time out of the It's like, what is that? That's pretty severe. As opposed to like 0.9, or point, you'll see some research articles that go down to 0.8. I see a 0 0.8, 80% of the time. I, I don't really read it. I just kind of run my fingers through and go like, fine, whatever. Because I know it's way too, there's so much chaff in there and so much wheat in there, so much interaction. It's useless for me. 
I, I can't read it. Can you say 80% of the time? Point A. Point a. You'll have the event occur, 20% not. So you're 80% smart, 20% stupid, as my professor used to say to me. And you know that it looks like this, right? It looks like a little Jesus fish, it's alpha, right? That's what, then when you're reading a research article, you'll see an alpha like that. It looks like a little Jesus fish. And subscripted to it will be your confidence level, right? 0 0.05, 0 0.01, right? You've seen this a thousand times, but now you know what the meaning is, what it is. You look at it and you say, oh, point 0.8, point 0.8, what are you doing here? Okay, sub uh, factoid here. Why do we use 0 0.05? Why is 95 times out of 100 our standard? You know why? Because of the, the sages of statistics, when this thing started, said, you know what, what do you want to do? And they said, okay, 95 times out of 100. It was arbitrary, but it was a decision that they wanted to make uniform because science has uniformity to it. So if we're doing work here in New York and somebody was doing work in like Aberdeen, Scotland, where like really statistics kind of started, everyone would still be at the same, uh, using the same rules in the same playbook. So there's a uniformity to experimental design on this. Okay, moving forward. Which one is worse in my, in your opinion, type one or type two, I ask rhetorically. A type one is worse. I'll just jump to the big reveal. A type one is worse. Why? What's the definition of a type one error? I claim that there's a finding, a true statistical finding, but in actuality, there isn't. Now, if you're doing like drug protocols and things of that nature, you don't want to go to, you know, you go to the doctor, you have, let's say, an upper respiratory infection, yeah? And he gives you an antibiotic. What's your assumption? What's your inference about this? That this has been tested under strict and rigorous conditions. And this particular chemical is going to, you know, staunch this bacterial infection, right? Significantly, right? In testing, right? You, you, you bet, you'd bet house money on this. Right? You, you'd bet big, right? You'd bet the mortgage money on that, that that really happens. Well, sometimes they play around with the data a little bit, but you don't want a doctor to say to you, like, oh, well, I'm going to give you this antibiotic. You go, okay. And then you ask the question, like, well, is this really good? Goes, well, kind of. It kind of works. What would you tell the doctor? Like, what are you giving me? What are you doing? Right? Because it goes against our, our intuition, our, our intuition, but it happens all the time where they pull drugs off the market and they put them in. So, type two would be like, so a type two error is bad on the other side. If you flip the coin, let's say you do have a drug that's actually doing what it's supposed to do, but you're such a restrictive scientist, you go, no, not good enough, right? I mean, we all know kind of people who are like, you know, it must be this way or, or you know, the wrong way. It's my way or the wrong way or, or it's the highway, you know what I mean? And I mean, and to be honest with you, you know, during you know my, my training, you know, I had professors like that, and you know, I didn't want to say anything. It's like, okay, yeah, I get it. This is like what not to do. This is like a story on like what not to do. And then when I got into consultancy and private sector, and doing, doing market research and consumer ears and all that, you know, you had people with other points of view and other perspectives. You know, but the takeaway was keeping it at about 0.05. Check your check everything at the door. Let the data speak to you, and if you need to manipulate a little bit, do it within a certain you know do it within the art of the science. You're not changing results. You're just allowing the, the thing to kind of express itself. So one second. So type one error, horrible. Type two error, bad. If, if we're going to put like a qualitative essence onto it. Would type two error be failing to you know, uh, side effect of a drug? It's whatever, the, it's whatever the hypothesis is. Yeah, it's whatever the hypothesis is. Usually with side effects of drugs, those are self-reported. You know, like when you're watching, like, you know, when they say, you know, they have some of these biologics, you know, biologics are drugs that are like made from biology stuff, like from cells and stuff, that's what they call biologics. So you'll see like, uh, like, um, like for fibromyalgia, they use a lot of biologics. 
I mean, that's a whole different discussion and a whole different thing. Don't, don't get me down this path of, of talking about it. But you'll see like may cause these different conditions. These are conditions that are either self-reported or what the researchers have found as they've gone through. And some of those, some of those things I'm going like, you know what, I'd rather have the pain than deal with like all these potential kind of things. But that's just me personally. You know what I mean? To me, what can't be solved with a nice martini and you know, you know, just taking a nap. You know, that's just my own personal thing. I'm not telling anybody to start drinking and do J drinking or whatever, but you know, it's like find other, you know, I'm I'm not big into medications, even though I'm sitting here taking a ton of medications. Okay. So here, this is this is a rather confusing table here. And I don't really like like this table because I have trouble thinking in multiple dimensions at the same time. Okay, so just use my definitions of what of when we reject and when we accept and the and the, and the vagaries of that. Okay, I, I just want to move past this one. I don't, I don't like this. Okay, here's another concept that need you guys to think about. It's usually in a research article, they'll talk about power and magnitude of effect. Let's talk about power. I'm not going to read this because that definition there is so confusing. Power is the probability that a study will reject the null when it is false and thus detect effects that actually occur. Power increases with the number. What is that? It's rather confusing. It's wordy. It's semantic. Let's talk about power. I'm going to lay it out in 23 words or less, and then we'll dig down and we'll, then we'll, then we'll break it down. Power means do I have enough bodies to turn on the lights? Do I have enough sample size in order to correctly get a finding? Okay, that's what power is. Is there enough sample to have an actual finding? So without knowing statistics, without knowing sampling design, and sampling is its own kind of sector, if you will, I know enough about sampling to get into trouble. Okay, and it's, yeah, it's a whole different thing. And it's like this, this mechanisms that they use. It's like, like it hurts my, you, you just see the water come running up over my eyes. But I know enough to get into trouble, okay? That means I know more than like most people. Does everybody agree? How do I have, is my sample large enough in order for me to find a consistent, stable, statistical finding? whether it's significant or not. So we're looking at stability of finding. Give you a quick example. You have more confidence in a group of 10 people making decisions or a group of 1,000 people making decisions. Intuitively, one would say 1,000, right? I'm just going to jump there, right? And that's true because the more people I have, the more it represents the population, right? Law of large numbers. If I have 10 people, I don't know who these 10 people are. They could be like, you know, weird or extreme or whatever, or uninformed, right? So you wanna make sure your sample is large enough. Now, there was a whole thing back in the day before computers were really accessible and you only had mainframes and stuff. There was a textbook called Power Analysis. And we used to call it the red book, like this thing. Had no words in it, it was just tables. And you would just have your alpha level and the number of, of samples that you would have and the number of subgroups that you have. And you'd run your finger and say, this is how many people I need in order to maintain power at 0.05 or 0.01 or whatever, okay? That was by a guy named Jack Cohn. That was a professor at NYU. Quick factoid, when I was doing my dissertation, I was back in New York, couldn't stand it, I couldn't take it anymore, so I left. Didn't have any classes. I was what they, you know, just they call an ABD, open dissertation. And uh, here I am in New York, and I have a question on my stats. I called up Jack Cohn, who uh, was at NYU. I said, "Can I come and talk to you for uh, half an hour?" I was, "Yeah, come on in." And he was very gracious. <laughs> so he was very gracious. I came in wearing like a sport jacket and tie, and he's like sitting there like, a, "It's like, what are you? Who are you?" <laughs> I said, "Yeah, I said, you know, homage. You know, it's like homage." But anyway, he was very gracious. So that's what power is. Did I have enough bodies to turn the lights on and to lead it? Okay, that's what power is. And when you read a research article, it's going to mention power. 
Okay, and now you know what power is. It may have a value after that. Doesn't matter, but you know that they take an effect of looking and saying like, do we have enough participants here? That's what power analysis is. Today, power analysis, you can Google it and, and you can Google power analysis. You come up with all these little apps that they have. You just like plug in two or three or four numbers, you know, like how many subgroups you have, how many bias you have per group, whatever. And it'll tell you which power is. So you can see if you need to bulk it up a little bit. Okay, back in the day, you couldn't do that. We had to use our chisel and our rock and etch things out. Okay. So if I know what my power is that I have enough bodies to make the magic happen, what does that mean at the end of the day when I do a statistical significance test? That's effect size, or as I like to call it, magnitude of effect. Okay. And I think I talked about this before, you know, sometimes these things kind of, you know, bleed outside the boxes a little bit. If you use some guided imagery here and I think of the color blue and I go from the lightest of blue and I go across to the darkest of blue, that's magnitude of effect the intensity of the finding, okay? So when you have significance and you know, let's say with a Z-test, criteria is 1.96, right? Without having say, just to say, let's just accept that. So if I have a Z-score and it's above 1.96, I go winner, winner, chicken dinner. I have statistical significance, right? because it exceeds what the criterion is, okay? That's effect size. So if I have an effect of one point, let's say 2.1 on my finding, on my Z, that's just getting dragged across the finish line, right? That's not, that's not a really powerful finding. But if I have a Z-score of seven or a Z-score of eight, what are you gonna say? Wow, this is a particularly strong finding. Let's go back to the Merck example, the one from real life with the COVID pill, right? The uh, therapeutic, which what it does is, are you guys familiar with this drug at all? Kind of, okay. What it does, it, it, when the virus enters, it starts attaching onto the cells and it starts to replicate, this drug goes in and breaks up the replication process. So it doesn't matter if you have a variant because they all have to start the same way, right? So it starts to break up that that protein synthesis, which is kind of cool if you think about it, because it's like becomes like a generic thing for like for most viral events, right? No, this, I thought it was very cool stuff. All right, so anyway, neither here nor there. That's effect size. Is I just drag it across the finish line, or does it fly over? Do I have a z-score of two point one? And what do you say about that? Not a whole lot, right? Oh, well, that's significant. Could have went either way. But if I have a, a z-score of seven or eight, I can. Stay with positive determination that, yeah, there's a real finding here and there's a real causal relationship. Now, why is this important for us in experimental design and looking at power and looking at, and looking at effect size and magnitude of effect? Because when you read that research article, 99.9% .9 of the time, everybody goes past the analytical section. Now you have an opportunity to just say like, oh, I might know I'm not gonna understand everything in it, but I know there's gonna be a Z-score or some sort of T-score, some sort of statistical value. They're going to show me significance and the alpha level at which it's significant. And they're going to show me the power and the effect size and all that kind of fun stuff. At least the magnitude of effect will show you, right? Which is called something else, it's called D. And then you'll be able to read the discussion section and say, are these people talking about a Z-score of like 2.1 and all of a sudden it's like the greatest finding in the world and I'm going to Oslo to pick up my Nobel? Because then you would like look at it and you're like, what are you talking about? All right, it's another piece of information for you to be better researchers and better understanding of experimental design. A lot of folks aren't gonna be researchers when you grow up, all right? You know, that's fine, that's, it is what it is. But at least when you read research, you, you gotta understand what am, what am I reading and, and how do I become a better professional for myself and my own character? And I don't care, you know, I don't, I don't really, Never really care what my colleagues thought. It's just like how I felt about myself, you know, or projected, whatever. Okay, between me and my therapist. Thing. Okay, two kinds of effect size. I've kind of talked about this. And I'm a big believer in how much variance I'm accounting for. They'll read research articles and they'll do what's called an R squared. 
You guys familiar with R squared? Heard of an R squared and all that? You guys know what an R squared does for you? I'll tell you, it's not a secret. I'll give you the reveal. An R squared is how much variance our causal relationship is accounting for. So, like everything else in the world, we know that a hundred a study has a hundred percent variance, but we cannot account for a hundred percent of it. We're only looking at how much our manipulation or our treatment is accounting for, right? So, what's a good R squared? How much? And I think I mentioned this before. How much variance does a a typical research study account for based upon the manipulation. Anywhere from about 20%, 25% around there. So if you have an R squared that's sitting at about 25%, you just check the box and go, okay, fine. As my professor used to say, may you rest in peace, Dr. Roy S. Lilly, stats professor, he used to say, Epstein, 30% variance accounted for. I say, well, we know 30% of what happened and 70% were kind of in the dark. He goes, no, you're 30% smart and 70% stupid. And he would look at me because he liked me. <laughs> but, but that's what it is. Now I continue to use that like a little bit of an homage to him. He's a very nice guy. All right, so we're only accounting for 30%. So this allows you to start to read the discussion section and start to put all the pieces together based upon what's the experimental design. What's my alpha? Did they just drag the finding across the finish line? Did they have enough power? All these different, all these chainsaws, now you have to start to work simultaneously. You gotta start thinking on multiple dimensional levels here, okay? All right, say like, you know, you gotta do the check boxes in your head. And then you gotta see like, what's my R squared? How much variance did I account for? Now I can account a small amount of variance, but have big changes, right? because that's something that we call relative versus absolute. I have 10 people, six of them like something, that's 60%. I have another group of 100 people, 20 people like something, that's 20%. So you like the alternate, right? So 60 versus 20, who's the winner? That's the, that's the relative, right? 60% is much significantly larger than 20%, and that would be reflected. But in actuality, we need to use the absolute. I got six people versus 20 people. Oh man, on my mind, it's like that's the difference. So you have to also keep an eye on this absolute versus relative. I just bring it up as a little side note. I'm not gonna quiz you on saying like, talk to me about absolute versus relative. But once again, this is where statisticians start to play a little bit of, start to play a little bit of games. You need to be aware of that. Okay, mean difference effect size D. This is what I was talking about. This is Cohen's D. You'll see this, and it's usually a small case D italicized and bold. So when you see that in a research article, that's your magnitude of effect. And that should hang around anywhere from like 0.3 to 0.5. All right? Without getting too far into the technical aspect of it. So that tells you how good a finding it is. So if you look and you see, oh, they have a large enough sample, that statistical finding kind of just doesn't cross over the finish line, but really, you know, scoots over it very nicely. And I have enough power and I have enough, uh, have enough R squared to say that, yeah, I account for 40% of the variance. And I have a magnitude of effect that's pretty powerful. Well, and guess what? I have a good study here and I can read this with relative assuredness that there's some real causal inferencing. Is there real some causal findings going on? Okay, that's what this is all coming down to. Do I have enough bodies? Is it strong enough? Is it powerful enough? This absolute relative thing, which I'm not gonna get into anymore. Okay, so what do we use? That means we have to use a statistical procedure. Okay, hang in there with me a little bit, guys. You have to have a statistical procedure. You have T-tests. When are T-tests used? You guys are familiar with T-tests. I know you have to be. Do you remember it? That's a different story. Okay, that's what I'm saying. You know, let's talk about it in English. You have three kinds of tests in this person's universe. You have t-tests, z-tests, and analysis of variance. 
brush stroke. Yeah, more than that, but you know, and some regression, which I don't really talk about because I'm not a big guy in regression. Regression predicts the future. I'm not Kreskin, I'm not Nostradamus. Okay, it doesn't work for me. I have a whole I have a whole screed that I can go on about that, but not the time and the place. T tests. Look at the differences between two sample underlying three times means. Averages, right? T tests are used to compare two samples. Now let's say I want to look at your performance versus another class's performance. I can consider this to be a sample of the university, right? Depending on how I set up my question, this could be a sample and the other class could be a sample. And then I need to use a statistically appropriate test. That would be a t-test. T-tests are used to look at the differences between two samples. That's what it does. And once again, at the end of the day, you do the calculation. It goes through the machine. You come up with a value. Either the value is the value that you calculate is larger than the one in the back of the book. And if it's larger than the one in the back of the book, yes, go ahead have a statistically significant finding. Okay. You can say there's a difference between this group and that group. So we have this group. And let's say you're exposed to a teaching regimen that's more always in class. And then you have the other group of, of students who are, who are matched, you know, you know, sampling wise, you know, where they do everything online. And that compare your test performances on scores. Okay. If there's a significant difference that one does better than the other, then I can say that, right? That's what sampling would, would do. And I have to make sure I have enough bodies. I have to make sure I have enough uh, you know, magnitude of effect issues and all that. So here we have, uh, I'm not even going to start to go through the calculation of a t-test. This is not a class in uh, statistics. Okay, so we're not going to go through that. But what you need to remember about a t-test is that as a very meat and potatoes approach, Okay, you're going to see a lot of t-tests when you read research, a lot of ANOVA, a lot of z-tests. Okay, you're going to see that these are the ones, these are, these are your basic working tools. Wrench, screwdriver, hammer. Everything else is conversation. All right, from a practical point of view. I can do a lot of damage with a screwdriver and a hammer, and I can prove it. Okay, I'm not allowed to touch anything in the house, in the apartment. Okay. Yeah, I can fix it. Yeah, okay. Famous last words. All right. Okay, directional hypothesis. So now we know, let me just go down very quickly. Now we know we have, you guys are familiar with this, the normal curve, right? It goes into many different names, the Gaussian curve, the Bell curve, Galois field theory, okay. But it doesn't matter. It's the normal curve. You've seen it a thousand times. 50% on one side of the mean, 50% on the second side, on the other side of the mean. Now we're looking at directional hypotheses. Let's think about our headache study. What's my hypothesis? My alternate hypothesis says that three aspirin will have a better mitigating effect than three M and M, right? So how does that work? What does it what does it come down to? It means that your headache will resolve in less time. Right? As opposed to more time with the M&Ms, yeah? So do I know the directionality of how I want my findings to be? They're gonna be on the negative side, right? Because it's gonna be less. I don't wanna have more time. This, this is time on the bottom, on my x-axis, yeah? I don't want more time for that. I want it to be less, right? If I have a drug that reduces pain or swelling, I want, I want much more effective analgesia, right? I want it to be faster. I want less time from onset to relief, yeah? So I want that. So I know the directionality. I don't need to look at what's over here because I know that's not gonna matter to me. If I give a multiple choice test, what's the highest score I can get? 100. What's the lowest score I can get? Zero. So I know I don't have to worry or account for any scores being like a minus 10 or a minus 20. Does statistics know that? No, statistics is saying, if you wanna look at both sides and account for both sides, I'm gonna to have to do that. But I wanna do that. I just know it's gotta go from zero to 100. So I can save all my variance, because variance is very rare, right? Variance is like plutonium, you can't get enough of it, right? 
Variance is like will o' the wisp, it's ethereal, you know, it just kind of flies away, it's ephemeral. So what we have here is that we know the direction we can save our variance and, and put it towards here to have a better, stronger, clearer understanding. If I have to dilute my variance in a nonsensical way by saying like, let me try to account for minus 20, that's ridiculous, right? If I know the directionality, whether it's headache mitigation, whether it's a test score, I can save my variance and have a better and clearer understanding, have more power for that. Now, if I don't know the direction, if I ask people, let's say, uh, I have three carbonated soft drinks on the table and I ask people to test them in terms of the amount of sweetness, I don't know what people's perceptions are of sweet, right? I have friends who like, they just take the sugar right into the coffee and I'm going like, oh my God, I don't even know how you have teeth in your head. I mean, I've seen this before. I don't know about you guys. Have you ever seen that? Where people like take like 12 sugar packets and they like this and I'm like, why bother? Okay, not healthy. Okay, just say it, not healthy, all right? So, you know, so for them, what I would consider sweet would be very different than what they would consider sweet. You know, when I was, and, and when I was, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, I had neighbors who were, who were, who were West Indian. And we'd always go over and they'd have, you know, like literally spicy food. They'd love to see me eat because I would take a bite of like a doubles or something, or I'd take a bite of something that was really hot and they'd just see the sweat start to go and everybody would start laughing. And I go, so you can laugh as much as you want, but I'm enjoying myself. I got a napkin, I can pat my forehead. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. So like to hot to my neighbors, okay, didn't care. You know, they, they could handle it. Me, I, I you know, it was like, go like, whoa, it's gonna be hot. Okay, so there's those differences. I can account for those differences. So I need to use both ends of the spectrum here. I need to go, I need to account for both sides of the curve. Upside is I, I, I have a larger basket. I can account for any findings. Downside takes more energy to do that, right? It takes more variance to account for that, for the allotment. It is my trade-off. But I have no choice because I don't know how people are going to react to that. Okay. Exam, boom, done, finished, zero to 100. Thank you. Have a great day. Come back next week, try to be. If I'm asking you how you're feeling today, I don't know. You could have started your day off not well. You started your day off fabulous. Don't know. So, usually, rule of thumb, if it's more of a quantitative issue, you can figure out the directionality whether it's a test, whether it's headache mitigation, whether it's some sort of thing like that where you know that it's a, you know, a quantitative issue. If it's a much more abstract issue, then you, need to, then you need to widen it out, okay? That's the rule of thumb. I'm talking about pair T tests. Yeah, let me just mention our computer analyses. Computers are great. They do all of the things that we don't want to do. Right, you know, the idea of a computer is what? To do repetitive tasks, right? They can do it quicker, and cheaper and better and faster and all that kind of stuff, right? The problem with computer analyses is that sometimes the information you get can be laid out inappropriately or laid out, can be, I don't want to say inappropriately, can be somewhat confusing. And it's hard to see other things that if you want to delve a little deeper, okay? So they kind of do like, you know, like, you know, the quick 50,000 foot view. Do I use computer analyses? Yeah. Lately, I've been using a lot of my own spreadsheets, just writing out the algos. They're not that hard for me, you know? It's like, yeah, let me just do this. Because a lot of these statistical programs on a home, on a home PC, even though my PC is a business PC and you know, my laptop, I mean, it's a screamer, it's still going to slow it down because it's got to load all those modules of SPSS. It's got to keep my world in resonance, you know? So it's like, oh, I just want to run this out next. Okay, I like computer analyses because I get to play with it a little bit, but still you got to be able to interpret. Oh, and here's a problem when someone tells you they're upset too. I've had this happening multiple times. And I'm not saying this is the standard, but I was, I was working and they, they brought in this big time like statistician guy to do work. Okay, I'm sitting at my desk. He brings me the computer runs and I say to him, I go, okay, what'd you find? 
He looks at me like I'm out of my mind and he goes, how do I know? I'm just here to run it. I just run it and give it to you. I said, you get $400 an hour for this? I said, I'm in the wrong business. He said, you know what? Thank you so much. I said, you know what? I ended the contract. And I said, I'll run it myself. I don't need it. He's got to interpret. Nobody interprets. It's less that it's issues, just run it and they never interpret. Really, it's a waste. Anyway, that's my, that's my bitching and moaning for that. All right, I want to take five minutes and then I want to talk about the next chapter. So take a break, go get a coffee or something. I don't want to chase people. So please come back soon. Okay. You got time to get a coffee. You don't have to run, you know, no running with scissors. But I want to get through this chat. I know we're going a little bit longer today than I usually do. And then we'll just like rock and roll it out. Okay, analyzing complex designs. Most studies that you're going to find, like 60% of the studies you're going to find are going to be control versus experimental. Okay, that's bang, 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 get it done, looking at one main thing. But there's a lot of studies out there that become much more complex, and I don't want to use the term complex in terms of difficulty, but it's like more things you need to follow. And that would be, let's say, having one, let's say the aspirin study, right? Aspirin versus M&Ms. So within aspirin, you can have three dosage levels or four dosage levels, low, medium, and high, right? So that has to be accounted for. That makes it what they call a complex design, okay? We're looking at what they do is what they, they'll link two independent variables together. Like let's say on a product design, like we're only gonna sell the widget in green. So it'll be what you're feeling about this green widget and these arms and legs to it. So they'll link stuff together, making it a little bit more complex. But the thing to understand is that when you're starting to do research, there'll be multiple groups and multiple independent variables that are affecting everything that you need to account for. Okay, so sometimes what happens is, is that you'll have more than one test versus another test. And here's where we're gonna start to talk about much more complex statistical procedures in order to tease out some of the subtle findings or some of the subtle results that are there. Because you can have significance and subtleties, right? You can, okay? Back in the day, a thousand years ago, I, I did a lot of work for a, uh, I was with a consultancy and we did, we did a lot of work for a, uh, I wanna say the client, cause I'm kind of bound by it, but it was a German automotive company, one that you all know, okay? And it was looking at multiple groups of sellers. You know, the, the goal of the game was to say, they wanna have an introductory vehicle for like young marriage with kids. So instead of a station wagon, this is right before SUVs and crossovers took place, okay? So this is like, we did some of the seminal work on this, you know, this consultancy I was with. So multiple groups, multiple this, multiple that. I mean, the study was a disaster. It was like, it almost killed me. Okay, it was, it was very difficult. And it just, that's a hard test. That's multiple tests to look at, you know, literally chainsaws being flipped around like a service performer. Okay, you can't do, T tests where you have multiple groups. Let me cut to the chase here. So I have three groups or four groups. Can I do T tests looking at group one versus group two, group one versus group three, group, group one? Group? Yeah, I can, absolutely. But what happens is, is that the inflation term, the error term 
starts to increase. What is a 0.05 confidence level? It's 95 times out of 100, yeah? That means I'm 95% smart and 5% stupid, right? So if I'm doing all of these groups and I'm comparing them, I keep adding 5% into the inflation term, therefore increasing it, right? So I have what I know and I have what I don't know. So I have my bucket of knowledge and my bucket of unknown. And I want my bucket of unknown to be like a little tiny thing, to be like a 12 ounce cup, right? I want my bucket of knowledge to be like, one second, to be like a big, a big pail. It gets to be turned around because this little guy starts to influence my findings because that 5% starts inflating, inflating, inflating. So you have a drip in your ceiling, you put a bucket under it, you just see one drip every hour, you go to sleep, you come back, the whole thing's almost overflowing. That's what we're talking about. It's death by a thousand little needles when you're doing these combinations. So you're adding 5% to everybody? Every time, every pair comparison. That's death, that's, that's killing. Can't do that. That leads to what? Type two error, right? Because I'm claiming I don't have a finding because I, there's so much chat in the week, yeah? Not good. So in order, we, we need to do that. And this is the problem with multiple teeth. I'm just, I don't want to even read this because this is like, oh, like way too confusing. Okay, so I'm just explaining it to you. When I do a test, I got knowledge and then I got remains. I keep putting the remains in a bucket that keeps influencing everything else because there's nothing hangs out by itself. Everything is related to everything else, right? It's a relationship. It's a ratio between finding and non-finding, right? Between wheat and chair, everything's related. So one thing you got to push, you got to have a pull. Okay, so here he starts getting into saying like, okay, let me just talk to this. Let me just give you the concept. Oh, we're not going to talk bomb for only. We're not going to talk any of this stuff. In order to control the amount of noise or error variance you're going to find that within the research article, they're going to talk about post hoc tests. Let me lay out in clear English as best I can what a post hoc test is. A post hoc test will compare all of the all of the, the comparisons, group one versus group two, one and three, right, all that stuff, in a very special way by controlling the error term. It'll suppress the error term. It's built in to suppress the error term. I'm not going to get into the statistical analysis of how it's done, the proving of it. But you take my word for it. Post hoc. Post hoc means after the fact. So you have your main effect, and then you got to go in, and you got to say, okay, I have four different groups. And I know that there's a difference between the four different groups. Which ones are not like the other? So I have to compare group one versus two, one versus three, one versus four, right? I got to see which one is causing the difference. Are all four different from each other? Is one different than three, but not two? I mean, what's my combinations here that are making the magic happen? So what we do is we do these, we do these post hocs that control the error variance, allowing us to get a clean read of whether there's a true significant difference. Now, here he mentions the Bonferroni. Let me tell you something. It's like going into a restaurant, looking under entrees, well, looking under desserts, because postdocs are after the fact, you already had a dinner. Looking and seeing like a whole combination of like different cakes and things like that. There's a million different postdoc tests. You got the Bonferroni, you got the Chaffe, you got the Tukey, you got like three, you got Tukey A, Tukey B, Tukey C, Newman Cools, you got a million of them. And as I tell my statistics class, when you're doing a postdoc, figure out which one you like and go with it. But they all do the same thing. There's no reason to, to know five different post hocs. It's like saying I have to learn how to drive a Mercedes and then I have to learn how to drive an Audi. 
Audi, and then I got to learn how to drive a Cadillac, and then I got to learn how to drive a Toyota. You had to drive one car, you know how to drive all the cars. It may have some subtleties with it, like the Benz is like, you know, with its, uh, you know, drive, you know, you got to like, it's like on the side here and you got to do, so it's like a whole little different thing, but it's a nuance, you know? But like a regular car, it's like you go park, reverse, neutral drive, you know, and then the two lower gears, okay, fine. You know one, you know them all. The purpose of the post hoc is to reduce the amount of error variance to get a cleaner read of any differences between the individual groups. And when you do the overall and you say there's a difference between the four groups, that is what we call a main effect, but they call it a model. The model is significant. Once again, they, they give it a label that sounds somewhat confusing. But now you know, now there's no confusion. Oh, now we move to here. This is the analysis of area. Look at the term. This is our meat and potatoes right here, ANOVA. I'm not gonna read the back, I'm not gonna read this chart to you. I'm gonna talk to you in English about what ANOVA does and why it's so important. Look at the term, analysis of variance. Day one, hour one. What have I been yammering about? Variance, 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 variance. You ain't got no variance, you ain't got no study, right? we go in with these hypotheses to say, even though we have a no, we also have an alternate that's going to be a difference between groups, yeah? And what are we trying to measure? Variance. Here is, a, is an approach that literally analyzes the amount of variance in three or more groups. And is it common to have at least three groups in, a, in an experiment when you read a research article? Yeah, you may have two independent variables or groups of independent variables versus a control, right? And it becomes much more complex. Like regression studies have like a million different things going on, in there, like unreadable, okay? Like I know how to spell Bayesian analysis, but I have no idea what it is. I do, but it's like, don't push it, you know what I mean? I know enough, like I said, I know enough to get into trouble. All right, not that I'm some genius, okay? Just been exposed to this stuff a lot. Here's how I want to explain analysis of variance. It works with three or more groups. If you have two groups, can I do analysis of variance? No, because then I can just do a t-test and bang, 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 I'm done, right? We do a z-test and I set up, right? yeah, done. But here I have three groups. And like I said, we want to reduce the error term so we don't want to have that inflation of doing those one versus two, one versus three, one versus four kind of thing. So let's think about this for a second. I have three different levels. I got low, I got medium, and I got high. Analysis of variance builds at the end of the, the day. Anyone remember what it was called, the last value? It's called an F ratio. Remember that, the F? You know why it's called the F? It was an homage to the greatest statistician ever, Sir Harry Fisher, the British uh, Stat Society said, we're gonna give you immortality by naming the ratio at the end of the analysis of variance, the F ratio, Sir Harry Fisher. Obviously nobody knows that, so I guess, I guess he doesn't have much immortality. <laughs> All right, but it's there, that's it. You go on Jeopardy, you'll be the smartest person there. you right? be like Ken Jennings Jr. I'd be able to rock out. Okay, so we have the F ratio. The F doesn't mean anything, it was just an homage. Okay, it has no other significance than that. So what is it a ratio of? Of what's going on between over the variance of within. I'll explain this in a second. So the F ratio, what's a ratio? It's one part this and two parts that, right? It's a relationship, remember that, right? It doesn't go away when we spoke about nominal scales, ordinal scales, right? Ratio scale, is the ratio was fully loaded, yeah? And we can do whatever we want with it. So what's the relationship between what's going on between the buckets and what's going on within the buckets? So we have within the buckets, we have variance, right? 
And we had the intersectionality, if you will use the current term, of what's going on between, right? Yeah, within and between. Within and between, within and between. So let's think about low, medium, and high on this ridiculous aspirin study, right? Let's say this is one, this is two aspirins, pills, and this is three, right? Now, just using a little bit of intuition and a little bit of an intuitive sense, if I give you, if you're having a real horrible migraine and I give you one aspirin, that's like a deck chair of the Titanic, right? <laughs> Seriously, that's not going to do a whole lot, right? So am I going to have a lot of variance in that group or a very little variance in that group? Think. I'm going to have a lot of variance because people are gonna have resolutions at very different times, right? The times are all gonna be all over the place. Some people will have resolution in 20 minutes. Some people maybe two hours later, right? It's, it's think of the distribution, you know? I think, think of it as like a big cloud, right? It's gonna be very, a lot of variance in there. I move to the second one, I give you two aspirins. Am I going to have a lot of variance or a little variance? I'll have less variance, really, right? Think about it because two aspirins are becoming more of like a normal dose, yeah? And people are, people are resolving their headaches much more consistently, yeah? That makes sense? And here, I should have the least amount of variance, right? If three aspirin are really much more effic efficacious, right? Much more helpful in resolving headaches, everyone's headaches should resolve a lot faster, yeah? I should have less variance. So what I'm looking at here, the intersectionality, if you will, is, is the variance of the low group, the median group, and the high group, its relationship to what the hell is going on inside each of the buckets. I got the overall buckets, low, medium, and high, but it has to be in relationship to the distributions that's going on with it. One second, one second. Let's sink in for a second. Okay, so I got one, two, and three, and it's how it's related to what's going on inside. So let me give you one more example that's a little bit ridiculous. I want you to think of soup. First one, it's a vegetable soup. I mean, we're talking about vegetable soup. So the first one is like more of like a consomme, right? More just like a liquidy soup, maybe a couple little pieces of carrot or something. Right? And you say, like, how many vegetables was in there? Not a whole lot. So you got a lot of berries, but you got to dig for it, right? You got, the, you got the label and you kind of go, like, I can't even get like a piece of carrot. What's going on in there, right? Here, we have more of a regular vegetable soup as we would think about it, right? But there's still a lot of soup, right? So you can use the ladle and you can come up with a fair amount of vegetable, right? Yes? Less variance, right? Here, they didn't use enough water, so it's more like a vegetable stew. Got me? So there's very little soup, much more veg. I mean, it's not a soup anymore. It's more like a stew. And I want to look at the, someone says, so what's the difference? Is there a difference between those three types of soups? Well, you know what? I really don't know, but let me tell you this much. I know there's a relationship between this, all three of them by what's going on inside of them, right? So I'm going to do a judgment saying like, very few vegetables, goodly amount of vegetables. It's no longer a soup. And how am I making that decision about what's in the bucket? Yeah? You see how it kind of works in the two dimensions on that? You guys got me a little bit? Question? Yes, let you talk to me. Yeah. Um, so for the, for the pills one, the pills example, the, the least variance is in the high because the time is going to take, so it's going to be less, less like, we're assuming, right? We're assuming, right? We're assuming, right? We're assuming that three aspirins are much more effective, so more people are going to be affected in a, in a good way, right? Less time, so, so that should be reflected, right, in the variance, right? Because the group they're going to be grouped together. If I give an exam and everybody gets a ninety on it, is there a lot of variance or little variance? It'll be little variance. We no variance. It's going to be like all crunchy, right? It's going to be like a it's going to be like a rich cracker in there, right? It's going to be tight, yeah? But if I give an exam and everybody in the scores are all over the place, it could be more like a cloud, right? right. So, but the more vegetables in the soup, the less, 
Yeah. Yeah, because it's all hanging together. Okay, it's it's. One more time, you don't get it, some other folks don't get it. Let me just go through it real quick and we can always do it next week too, it's not a problem. Someone's gonna ask me like, like which soup you know, has like, you know, goodly amount of vegetable, whatever. Well, I go, the first one has no vegetables in it. You know, the first bucket, second bucket has a goodly amount. And the third bucket, it's no longer soup, it's more like a stew because it's somebody who's got to put water in, right? But how am I making that decision? I'm making that decision in relationship to what? of what's in the bucket. So I have the total entity, yeah? And you're making a decision based on what? What's inside. And then, you, and then you're using your mind to kind of build the relationship between what's inside and what's between. So the more, the more vegetables are, the least variance. Yeah, let it, let it sink in, yeah. But, but say, but if I asked you, uh, which soup has has the best amount of which which soup is soup that has a good amount of vegetables? You say the medium one, right? I don't want to get caught up in this guy's right. Last time, right? And how'd you make that decision? You made that decision by saying like I got three different soups here, right? But I'm making my decision based upon what's inside the bucket. We'll talk about it next week. I just I don't want to get I don't want to get caught up here. So anyway, so that's what analysis of various does. It's, those, it's the intersection of those two dimensions of what's going on within and the going on between. I think we're just about there. Okay, ANOVA uses the F test and it uses the ratio. It is a ratio, it is not a value, okay? Even though we call it a value, whatever, it's a relationship about what's inside versus between. Not talking about this. Well, he gets into that, right? Okay, I'm gonna break here. Okay, call it a day here. And next week we're going to finish up with the fact with, with kind of like a new chapter in the Nova, if you will, the remainder of what a factorial design is. And I'll talk about that and we'll finish it up. Uh, as I said before, uh, what we're going to do is if you want to come to class next week, that's fine. If you don't, I'm going to record anyway, and I'll put it up.